video of the final moments in the life of Charles Jason Toll. It documents a cell extraction, a controversial procedure routinely used in prisons and jails. hard to watch. Welcome everybody, I'm Deborah Roberts, and if you were appalled by that video, then consider this. That's only a small part of the actual event that took place, and just gives you a little bit of an example of how the mentally ill fares sometimes behind bars. Incarceration, as you've learned today, can be very difficult, but for people who suffer from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or drug addiction, it can be an absolute nightmare. Their disease can go untreated, and it often is misunderstood, and their behavior is construed as criminal when really it's just a symptom of what they're suffering from. There are well over one million people in prison in America with mental illness. One million suffering from mental illness, and more than half of that incarcerated population is drug addicted. It's a brutal consequence of our nation's failed mental health system and our long war on drugs. In fact, with few state hospitals left for patients to go, our nation's three biggest jails, L.A. County, Cook County in Chicago, and Rikers Island right here in New York have now become the largest mental health facilities in the country. Well, to discuss this, and to bring some personal perspective to what it is like to have mentally ill behind bars, uh, I'd like you to meet my panel. To our left, Joanne Minnick, a mental health advocate who has become an advocate because she is the mother of Peter Minnick, who is 31 years old. He was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and Peter was recently incarcerated at Bridgewater State Hospital in Massachusetts. She'll update us on his situation in a moment. To her left, Francis Greenberger, who's the founder and co-chief executive officer of Time Equities and founder of the Greenberger Center for Social and Criminal Justice. His son, Morgan, who's 21, struggles with mental illness and is currently incarcerated in New York. And to his left is Mitch Rosenthal, a pioneering psychiatrist who has worked in the field of addiction for over 40 years. He is the founder and executive director of the Phoenix House Foundation and has been a White House advisor on, ad on addiction. Welcome to all of you. I'd like to start off with you, uh, Francis. Why don't I start with you, if we, because you and I were just speaking in the green room about your son. He's so young. Tell me about him and his journey, because I know that there were times when you weren't even sure what you were hearing from him was actually the truth. How is it that you first came to realize that he was suffering from mental illness? Well, Morgan's uh, illness uh, showed up very early in life, really, when he was in nursery school. And it was later aggravated by the death of his mother when he was uh, six or seven years old. He's had a variety of diagnoses. Uh, early, early diagnosis was ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, PDD, pervasive development disorder. And around 15, someone decided that he was within the autistic spectrum and diagnosed him as autistic personality, borderline personality disorder. So the, the, the diagnoses are, are, uh, c cover a spectrum which is, which is not unusual. Um, and uh, he committed uh, uh, two crimes, senseless, both of them. One of them, I mean, senseless in a normal sense of, of uh, understanding his motivations. He, he and another person stole some money from a taxi. Um, and when I said to him, well, Morgan, you were five minutes from the office. I always give you whatever you need. Why didn't you come here and get it? Uh, he said, well, I, need, I didn't have any money then. 
So as I processed it in my own mind, I realized that one of his greatest needs were for socialization. And the fact that he had met whoever this idiot was on the street, and sure, he said, oh, let's go rob a taxi. So that's what they did. Uh, his second crime, uh, he also took drugs on occasion, and he was in some drug-related uh, paranoia, fit, fit of paranoia, and uh, thought a drug dealer was chasing him, went to his apartment, called the police. They came, they didn't know what to do with them, and left, and he continued to experience his fear, and he decided to start a small little fire on his stove, called the fire department, didn't leave the apartment. Uh, they came, put the fire out, and charged him with arson. He thought they were somehow, I guess, going to protect him from this drug dealer. So, uh, um, you know, these are the impulsive actions of uh, someone who suffers from what, whatever his uh, particular brand of mental disorder is, uh, and uh, um, what I've had to deal with for a lifetime. And unfortunately, he was introduced to Rikers, and so many of us, maybe through recent news reports, know of Rikers and some of the notorious, brutal incidents involving the mentally ill. How did he uh, fare there? Well, Rikers was, was, a, was a tough go for him, as it is for almost anybody. Uh, and uh, he was there almost for two years until his sentence was finally resolved. Two years? Two years. Uh, that's not that unusual. Uh, I understand in the Bronx, there are some people who spend three to five years before their cases are resolved, sentences determined, and they're sent upstate. Anyway, I would listen to the story, you know, I would go visit him uh, on a very regular basis, and he would tell me these stories about ambulances to nowhere, being beaten up by correction officers when there was no provocation, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it seemed fantastic to me. I couldn't really, you know, frankly, I, I didn't know what to think of it. Couldn't quite believe him. And then, of course, suddenly, in the last few months, pick up the New York Times, and there were the stories about the ambulances to nowhere. And the, uh, and, 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 and the beatings and all the things that he had been telling me about. Joanne, these, uh, some of these incidents sound pretty familiar to you, I'm right. sure. Tell me about Peter and what led you to realize that he uh, had problems and also was first introduced to right. My story is a little bit different in the fact that Peter was never in trouble with the law. Um, he had a really happy childhood, played sports, um, you know, was very artistic, um, and was originally diagnosed with ADD. And I often wonder if ADD is a precursor to schizophrenia, which is his actual diagnosis. Um, he, you know, was in and out of hospitals after he graduated from high school. He managed to get a, a high school certificate. And, um, you know, he was fine. We, we were able to help him. You know, he, he could hold a part-time job. He was able to try to live on his own. And he also, um, you know, took the transportation to and from his clinic. And then um, his insurance ran out, and he was placed in the Department of Mental Health in Massachusetts. And that is where he was criminalized and house, uh, warehoused for non-volitional acts um, uh, caused by his illness. And the same thing, impulsivity. Um, you know, they, anybody with schizophrenia has a hard time with impulse control. Um, and he was dumped at Bridgewater State Hospital. And what's frightening about Bridgewater is that um, it's a state hospital, but it calls itself a hospital, but it, in actuality is a prison run by the Department of Corrections and prison guards. And it is not run by the Department of Mental Health, which is a real problem. And it's the only facility, correctional facility in the country that sends mentally ill men. They are convict, not, convict, not convicted of crimes, but charged with crimes. And that's what's so wrong. Um, you know, the system is broken. There's no facility in between uh, Bridgewater State Hospital and the Department of Mental Health that could treat someone uh, with a little bit more challenging of the case. And in Massachusetts, that's exactly what happened. Um, they closed Taunton State Hospital, they closed Medfield State Hospital, and as a result, they had no choice but to dump these patients and warehouse them in prisons. And so then they become sort of criminalized. Mitchell, let me... Criminalized, you, absolutely. Let, let me ask you, because when you both talk about their behaviors and, and so much of it being a symptom of their illness, uh, when they are in, when the people are, uh, mentally ill people are actually incarcerated, it's sort of hard for them to follow the rules anyway, so they're probably more likely to serve more time, well, right? It's a, it's a 
absurd, Deborah, that we have uh, seriously mentally ill people in jails and not in mental hospitals. It's just wrong. Beside, and and you gotta, you got to go back and trace the history of this a bit. I mean, we started to deinstitutionalize, making the mental hospitals the, you know, the, the culprit. The bad in guys. Fact, in fact, while there were some abuses, by pulling totally out of that, we don't have anymore the, the armament to take care of seriously mentally ill people. Mm -hmm. So they end up in jail. And there's another factor here that's important. Uh, when I was studying psychiatry and, and uh, seeing psychotic people, I could, with another psychiatrist, commit that person to long-term psychiatric care. Today, you cannot do that. Somebody has to be uh, uh, in danger of hurting themselves or in imminent danger of hurting somebody else in order to be committed, and usually that doesn't last for more than 72 hours. So we, have, we really need to revisit the laws of commitment because if these young people could have been committed to psychiatric hospital, they never would have gotten to jail in the first place. Well, Francis, you actually tried that approach with your son, right? Well, uh, yes. To try to cut a deal with the, right. the I DA. Mean, what, what my experience was in talking with the DA, if you presented him with you know, his psychiatric profiles for stack this high, and we said, look, this, this is a person who has a mental health uh, exactly. uh, issue, and uh, wouldn't a placement in a mental health program be more appropriate? And the DA actually agreed, and he said, well, bring me a lockdown uh, mental health facility, and I'll seriously consider it. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but he was sending me on a fool's errand. Uh, I ran around and tried to find such a place. He recommended some place in New in Staten Island, which I found was in the Bronx. I got him admitted to the program. And then when I came and said, here, he is, here it is, he said, uh, oh, no, that's a drug program, and it's not secure enough for me. And, uh, um, uh, and that, has, that conversation, although it was a negative experience, obviously, and in the end, my son was uh, um, uh, uh, sentenced to regular incarceration has led me to uh, be advocating and trying to create a, the program that is missing. We're do I'm doing it within the spectrum of the criminal, just, uh, criminal justice system, but frankly, it's needed before the criminal justice system as mm -hmm. well. And what we want to do is create an innovative uh, a lockdown mental health program, uh, in our case, an alternative to incarceration, that um, uh, um, has innovative uh, um, uh, programming and therapies associated with it. We have particular concepts that we have in mind. Um, uh, and really uh, invent a better uh, um, mental hospital. We're not calling it a mental hospital, it's not a mental hospital, but to some degree it is. Deborah, if I can, Phoenix House has been working in prisons and as alternatives to incarceration for 48 years in New York, in California, in Texas, uh, in, in New England. We have, the good news is, we have the methodology to handle people who have co-occurring disorders, who are using drugs, who are mentally ill. The bad news is we don't have the framework of laws, as Francis is pointing out, well, which, are gonna under, which are gonna underpin this and make it real so that people are not going on fool's errands. And, and uh, we c and the other thing we need, as our judge said earlier, is money, because we're not investing enough money in long-term treatment, which makes a tremendous difference. I mean, you know, the celebration is the Johnny Perez's, who we saw here earlier today. They're the exciting news. The, the exciting news is that people who go through programs like Phoenix House come out the other side, become leaders in this work, and become advocates and mentors of the people who are coming in the door. We have good solutions here. But the key is convincing the public that this is worth investing in. Well, it's That's a combination the of the public. And the and, politicians. And, and as Jeremy Travis uh, stated earlier, uh, um, the politicians. And that is one of the, wor one of the things that the Greenberger Center is attempting to do, is engage in, in and we are in active discussion with the various uh, um, political organizations or, or government organizations 
that control this. And it has been the case that for uh, the last 50 or 60 years, it's been essentially against public policy uh, to allow for these kinds of lockdown facilities. And uh, as was alluded to, we went from 550,000 mental health beds in the United States in the 50s when the population was half what it is today to 40,000 today. And uh, so pro rata, we need a million, uh, we would need a million beds if we were going back to where we were in the 50s. Right. And uh, it, coincidentally, there happened to be about a million mentally ill people in jail. So. But what's really important is it's cheaper to, to house them in a jail than to provide them the services they need at a Department of Mental Health. Although, and that's a big issue. Although, yes, but if you really understood that the term that people spend in jail when they're mentally ill as opposed to uh, other situations uh, and the rates of recidivism, et cetera, um, the, the, mm -hmm. the, it, what might be more money in a shorter period of time uh, with a better result, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm not even sure that the economics are quite as disbalanced as they might appear. Well, I know uh, that my but, son's but, bill from the Department of Mental Health for one year was four hundred and sixty thousand oh. dollars, and we ha also had to contribute twenty-one thousand dollars for his care. What care did he get? He got no care there. That was the problem. Well, let's talk about that—the care and when the, when they're incarcerated. Um, and I know that your son obviously was not in an incarceration kind of situation, but Mitchell, the the what are the chances that these inmates are going to actually be treated for their illness when they are actually behind bars? Well, there are states not enough, there are states that are trying to bring good, enlightened services in and deliver services and deliver psychotropic medications as well in jail. So there are ways that you can work within a jail. We've got a, we've got, we're working with a thousand prisoners in the state of California as we're sitting here right now. But we've got to change the framework. A jail is not, jail and prisons are not the place to be delivering the main services for uh, either, e either for addicts or for mentally ill people. And when you mention addicts too, when you mention addicts too, that is actually, there's another shocking statistic about that. Of the more than 2.3 million people in jails and prisons in this country, more than 65% meet the criteria for substance abuse addiction. So we're talking about a lot of addicts in prison as we, as we uh, go along. Let's talk about some of the nitty gritty um, issues that they face because solitary confinement, we hear a lot about that with prisoners in general. Both of you, your, your sons have had, have dealt right. with solitary confinement. Your son for how many hours? My son was confined for 6,300 hours in a, uh, locked in a cell with nothing to do all day long. There is a picture oh. of him actually. And uh, oh. he also was in restraints for 800 hours. And, and what, what impact does that have on him well, psychologically? Who knows what damage it's done, but um, you know, he's, he's very fearful now. Um, thank goodness he's not at Bridgewater anymore, and the reason he's not is because I had to file a lawsuit against the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the Department of Correction, the superintendent uh, uh, at Bridgewater State Hospital, the Virginia for-profit company that has the contract to run the clinical staff, and, and it was for that reason that my son, thank goodness, is no longer at Bridgewater. Did he get his, uh, well, good for you, yeah. for working that case. How about his medication, uh, his, his, any particular well, kind of therapy treatment when he was at Bridgewater? No, it was lockup, basically lockup. No, there was no treatment, as far as I can make out. Reading his records is appalling. Um, you know, half the stuff that went on, I would never have known um, about if we hadn't actually asked for all his records. I mean, one time he was in restraints for 50 hours. That's two days. No, Continuously. Calm, yes, calm as could be with a sheet tied around his chest. What, what purpose did that serve? It served no purpose whatsoever. Francis, your son too, uh, a solitary confinement, yes, those kinds of things? certainly spent his, uh, his share of time in the box. Um, uh, and I think that uh, it, is, it is hard to judge what the long-term effect is, although we know what, what, what the studies show, what the research shows. It aggravates uh, um, the uh, condition of people, particularly with mental illness, and uh, um, it's not—it's not an acceptable solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not underestimating the difficulties that uh, um, uh, that that this population uh, um, 
represents. Mm -hmm. but, but we're doing as bad a job as we possibly could. And uh, um, it's not my, it's not, it's not the value that I grew up with as an American, not how we approach problems and uh, um, uh, with, the, with the hopelessness, with the res resources and, and with, with innovation to find solutions. And uh, locking them up in a two by, three, two by seven box or three by seven You've box. You've got to turn around this mindless uh, uh, cycle of locking up and locking up and locking up. Which uh, is basically and, and you had a lot of very smart people up here today talking about things that can be done. Uh, it's, there's not just one thing. There are a dozen or two dozen different things that have to be done. Do you think that we are any closer to getting a public will to make these kinds of changes? When you think about... You know, the, the, only say, thing, the, the only public will that's been driving this has been the bureaus of the budget of the different states. Yeah. Uh, they, they've been driving it because they want to bring down the enormous costs of incarceration. Uh, we haven't had enough uh, enlightened policy. With an important exception, I mean, drug courts across America and district attorneys across America are looking very hard for alternatives to incarceration. And we have thousands and thousands of people uh, in the country and the cities uh, who are uh, in other things than jail. So we have, we have good models, but uh, not enough, and I don't think we're turning the corner yet. Well, but I think there is, I mean, I'm relatively new to this world, uh, um, but, in, but I've, I've had extensive conversations. <coughs> I went on a listening tour. I talked to the high and mighty. I talked to inmates. I've been uh, in programs with lifers at St. Quentin. I've been around. And, uh, um, uh, but there is a sense, I have a sense, of, of the world changing, of, the, of, of America realizing what's going on, uh, um, and that uh, this is not something that we can uh, uh, accept. And uh, that, uh, um, you know, certainly we've all seen the commitment of the New York Times uh, on a journalistic level to, to bringing out the story. And I, and I just think as I, as I go out, the, the winds of, of change are there, and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that um, uh, there will be new approaches and new solutions. Well, putting a public face on uh, this, this issue and, and, and a, the face of a parent on this issue is so important. Many of us have seen uh, uh, news reports recently of Amanda Bynes, the um, Hollywood actress who many have declared to be mentally ill, wandering around the city, and, and many people have been very critical of her parents. How can they let this happen? Give us an idea of what impact this has on a parent to have an adult child dealing with mental illness and oh, to some degree to have your hands tied and change behavior. It is behavior. so challenging. Um, it's so challenging to try to fight the system and try to, to get the help that, that your child needs. And it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. Every single night you worry about, you know, is he okay? Is he safe where he is? Um, you know, what's going to happen to him tomorrow? But you know, in my case, um, and I don't know if anybody knows much about what's happening in Massachusetts, but I would suggest that you um, look at the reports from Michael Resendez, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative uh, journalist who has written a whole bunch of stories about what's going on at Bridgewater State Hospital. And as a result of that, um, we have a class action suit and we are hoping to affect um, amazing changes. Um, again, it's, it's budget dr driven, so we're hoping that something will happen and that will be an ongoing, um, you know, process um, until we finally get some resolution. The federal laws right now, there, as you said, there is hope of making some changes. Um, new federal legislation to reduce sentencing for nonviolent drug offenders, but in the meantime, we talk about the mentally ill being incarcerated, but having drug offenders being incarcerated mm -hmm. too, I mean, that's, that's another issue that, that we're going to have to come well, to grips with. There is a national movement now not to incarcerate uh, nonviolent drug abusers, and in every instance to try and get them into community-based treatment as opposed to jail. And uh, there's a realization that that is much, uh, that is very cost-effective. For every dollar you spend, that way you save seven dollars. It's a uh, the, and and the, the criminal justice system knows this, but still we have cases like we're talking about here that just break your heart. 
uh, that, that should not be in jail. Well, there is a lot of work to be done, but thankfully for your sons, you're leading the charge, you've become advocates, you're changing the, uh, the scope of the argument, and maybe with uh, some time, this, uh, this new uh, alternative sentencing and this alternative facility that you were trying to work on, uh, Francis, will uh, have an impact. We thank you so much for all of your time here uh, with us, Joanne Menick, Francis Greenberger, and Mitch Rosenthal. I wish we had more time to discuss more solutions, but thank you so much for bringing this to the table. <laughs>